Hello and welcome to the 144th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Monday, the 4th of January 2021 and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We begin this new year with the first of a three-part interview with Mike McNair, where we get deep into the weeds, the reeds and the rushes on his revolutionary strategy. This week I have the new patrons Dogen, Electrician Apprentice, Pierre Laplace and Johan to thank. Part 3 of this interview will be released to patrons late next week. So head on over to the Patreon if you'd like to support the show, where you'll get a lot of extra episodes and live streams. Okay, let's get down to business. Oh yeah, what if you have to change course? Which you, the likelihood you have to change course in one way or another is pretty fucking high. My 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 understanding of what the book is proposing is not that there's a solution that this is a sort of guaranteed to work situation, but that you're in a better position when crisis comes along if you've been doing the preparatory work than if you haven't been doing the preparatory work in the sense that we've had over and over and over again revolutionary crises in third world countries and some significant revolution things close to revolutionary crises in uh, advanced countries. I don't think 1968 was an actual revolutionary crisis, but 1974 in Portugal was an actual revolutionary crisis. And the far left, because it's so fixated on trying to be the spark that lights the prairie fire, hasn't done the preparatory work which would enable it to intervene effectively in that situation. But at the same time, once the damn thing breaks out, you're stuck with trying to deal with it with whatever forces you've got, however unsatisfactory that is. However small and however disorganized a, those, those forces are. Yeah. Why do you think the 68 wasn't and 74 was? Uh, essentially, is, has the army stopped to bang orders? Is politics e- e- emerging in significant numbers in the ranks uh, and the middle cadre of the army? Was there not in 68 like a fear by de Gaulle that he wouldn't be able to call on the use of his soldiers within France and that's why he went to Germany to get them from the Rhineland? And then they wouldn't let him have it. Which is, <laughs> why, didn't, why wouldn't they let him take soldiers from the Rhineland back to France? This is the NATO high command. Because uh, they wanted to extract a price. There was a price. There was a price that, that, that in essence, the... How shall I put this? The uh, the French had terribly embarrassed the United States over the coincidence of Suez and Hungary in 1956. The Brits and the French. The Brits got screwed over by being made to go into the European Union and give up empire preference. And the French got weren't quite as heavily screwed over as the British in 1956. But in 1968, de Gaulle was pursuing an independent foreign policy vis-a-vis Russia relative to the United States and vis-a-vis various third world countries. And um, 68, it was convenient for de Gaulle to have to make concessions. And conversely, it would have been terribly embarrassing in the middle of the Prague Spring and the propaganda campaign which was being run against the Soviet Union over the Prague Spring for there to be large-scale repression in France by virtue of the French army being deployed on the streets. Yes, it probably is the case that at least parts of the French army were beginning to fray a bit, but not to the point that you actually got. It was at the point at which the government could back off from its policy and not be faced with order number one and uh, soldier soviets and all of that sort of stuff. The same with actually the Tahrir Square stuff in Egypt, you know, that they backed off and dumped I can't remember the guy's name, the old dictator. Mubarak. Mubarak, in time to stop the army beginning to refuse orders. And that meant that the army was still there to be the deployable against the Muslim Brotherhood when uh, it came time for Sisi to get rid of the Brotherhood. And in the same way with de Gaulle, okay, they made massive concessions. They made really big concessions. But those concessions made things safe. And among other things, the United States actually got the overriding of de Gaulle's veto on British entry to the EU and thereby paralysed 
the project of European unification because the Brits could interpose the veto whenever anything no. inconsistent with US interests was proposed. No longer, Mike. No longer. A free yeah, and independent, yeah. proud nation. <laughs> what the implications of that are, God knows. I, I, I my guess actually now is Biden having got in that the uh, Americans will find ways to make life unpleasant for the British government unless the British government caves and enters into a Brino deal. Well, the, like, the, the big phone call that was supposed to be there at the week last weekend you know it was an obvious cave and it's hard to know whether it was a cave or whether like the whole idea of a no deal brexit even if there was going to be a brexit the pr would be there's going to be a no deal because boris has to be seen as the white knight so it's yeah. like like it seems well, it's hard to know yeah. you think there's american pressure you think there's american pressure pushing him to basically concede to european well, it's, it's was panic at the moment when it became clear that the American state was not going to back Trump resisting the electoral victory of Biden. Yeah. Suddenly there's panic in number 10 and Dominic Cummings and his mate whose name I can't remember, Kane, got kicked out, bang, abruptly. And then the next couple of days later, we get a big announcement about British increase in defence spending, which is trying to get back one of the aspects of Britain's position in relation to the United States has been to be the attack dog, the guys who are most committed to heavy defence spending and can be deployed. Though the British Army, unfortunately, the well, unfortunately from the British point of view, the British Army has rather disgraced itself in Helmand province and in Basra and doesn't look quite like the hard, sharp edge that it looked like between the 1950s and, well, no, between the end of conscription in the 1960s and the Blair administration. You think they were too soft in, like, as in for the Americans, it, the British were too it, soft? You know, they, they, the British Army has been selling itself as being really great at counterinsurgency work. And it was pretty successful at counterinsurgency work in Malaya and in Borneo in the confrontasi between Malay and Indonesia in the early 60s and in the secret civil war in Yemen and the intervention in Oman. Uh, they lost in South Yemen, but that was the operations of Mad Mitch. Mitchell screwed up their intelligence operations in the last year and they had, they, they, they just couldn't hold it. And uh, in effect, in the six counties, that was a successful counterinsurgency operation. So that, yeah, the Brits had a good record of success in counterinsurgency operations. And they, the, the British army constantly preened itself on having a good record of success in counterinsurgency operations where the French and the Americans had done bad in Vietnam. Yeah. And then, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq turns out that the British army ain't so good at counterinsurgency operations anymore. Anyhow, for whatever That's reason, good. I'm not clear why, but it's good to hear. You know, like in Ireland, a lot of time goes around the pictures of the counterinsurgency in uh, Malaysia, where they have the beheaded villagers. And uh, is it the, was it the Paris? I think it's, is, is it the Paris? And the sergeants holding the heads of the villagers that they've just chopped off. That's counterinsurgency, isn't it? Okay, let's hit a, a real question here now, instead of me bringing it off, leading you down the garden path. In Chapter 5 on Communist Strategy and the Party Forum, you mentioned that we can block with the right wing of the workers' movement on issues and take membership in parties and organisations they control. But you also say we need to organise independently of them. This seems like it's something of a contradiction in, in the overall strategy. It's only mentioned the entryism into their organisations, only mentioned... I think in that one sentence or two in the entire book, how do you relate the strategy of patience to this kind of entryism? Okay, I have actually written about this in a series about a three part series about the Trotskyists and entry in the British Labour Party. And the British Labour Party is to some extent a special case because it has this contradictory character that on the one hand, it claims to be a federation of all the workers' organisations so that it's got 
political parties affiliated to it. The Cooperative Party, Polar Zion, which calls itself the Jewish Labour Movement, is actually the British affiliate of the Israeli Labour Party and a, a number of other organisations, the Fabian Society and so on and so forth. And, and it has historically had political parties affiliated to it. And on, so it pretends by virtue of the trade union affiliations and having socialist societies affiliated to it, that it's a general front of the whole of the working class. And on the other hand, it pretends that it's a loyalist organisation, it claims to be a loyalist organisation. And it claims to be a loyalist organisation, an organisation which is loyalist to the UK constitution, primarily by bans and prescriptions of leftists, which at the present time takes the form of the fake anti-Semitism campaign of defamation, which is in essence what it is around anti-Semitism and the purging of individuals on that basis, which is just a way of saying you have to be loyal to the British state and in particular to the British state's subordinate alliance with the United States of America. In the case of the Labour Party, therefore, my this is just my view, is that the left should be fighting for the right to affiliate without the bans and prescriptions. And that actually would be, it, there's a sense in which that would be better done by a large party of the left, an organisation of the scale of the old Communist Party outside the Labour Party, than by people doing burrowing in Labour Party entry work. But having said that, I suppose there is a mass movement taking place, there's a mass support Mass, mass movement of inside the Labour Party, as, for example, with the Corbyn movement. In essence, the, the accident of Jeremy Corbyn being let onto the list by the so-called morons you know, had the consequence that there was a flood of two, three hundred thousand people into the Labour Party hoping for something different. And to work with the, the, the essence of Part of the essence of, of, of communist strategy is that you should actually work with the movement where it's happening. Yeah. This is not, you know, this is not, not, nothing particularly unusual that I'm saying here. This is standard stuff. You work with the movement where it's happening. It's just an unusual thing that the Morning Stars Communist Party of Britain guys um, didn't want to go in with were happy to have their relationship indirect through the Labour trade union bureaucracy via the Morning Star and not and to try and persuade leftists to work outside the Labour Party in order to leave the bureaucracy in undisturbed control. On the other hand, the Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers Party have the same bleeding position as the Morning Star, except with they give it a justification, which is that they say that the Labour Party has ceased to be a workers' party. OK, so suppose it's not the Labour Party, but a regular Social Democratic Party like, well, not the Dutch PVDA, because it's, the Dutch PVDA is the Labour Party. The German SPD was remade after the Second World War as a Labour Party. But like the, the, the French Socialist Party or the French Communist Party, these are mass workers parties. Suppose there's a movement there. There's nothing wrong in principle with people taking up membership in order to be in the same places where people are actually trying to try to be in the same places where people are actually moving. But what you have to do is not make that into an absolute that we have to be in, come what may, we have to be in the Labour Party slash the only way forward is a Labour government. The only alternative, because if we say the only way for alternative is a Labour government, then we find that we're actually giving unlimited free credit to the right wing because they're in control. So it's, it's, it's a question of um, participating just the same as you participate in strike struggles, in spite of the fact that the strike struggles aren't part of your immediate, your long term objectives and not just to win through strike after strike after strike. Nonetheless, you have to participate in strike struggles. Similarly, you don't, I don't believe that we're going to win by building big, more and bigger. Arthur Boff argues that essentially the strategy of the workers' movement has to be to build more and bigger cooperatives and cooperative healthcare and cooperative and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't believe that's the case because I think the bourgeoisie will use its control of the state to expropriate. You build a successful cooperative and the bourgeoisie will either 
insist on regulatory reform, in quotes, which will uh, give control back to the capitalists or scam you into kept taking a bridge too far, as happened to the co-op bank, in essence, that Gordon Brown uh, used the co-op bank to bail out a couple of bankrupt building societies and bankrupted the co-op bank by doing so, which then leads to the co-op bank being handed over to a, a hedge fund. So I don't believe in that, but at the same time, nonetheless, one would participate in cooperatives alongside people who have that strategy. and One would participate in where it's appropriate to do so in uh, right-wing self-democratic parties alongside, so far as there are essentially people in there who are trying to make change, to create uh, serious change uh, through the vehicle of this party, because they have a belief, probably mistaken, that this party can be turned into a vehicle for radical change, which I don't think it can. Well, yeah, like it, it seems to me like that the tactic of it's a tactic of going into parties like the Labour Party to be where the struggle is at is that the actual overall entry of the left into an organization like the Labour Party is, you know, you're fighting an internal battle that you are structurally incredibly likely to lose in the yeah, medium I, term. I, my, and my preference from this you, point of view is uh, is not for wholesale. Well, my preference, as far as the Labour Party is concerned, would be to win affiliation and to win the abolition of the bans and prescriptions. But of course, in order to get that, we'd have to win the majority in the big trade unions. Yeah, so we'd have to win the majority in Unite, Unison, and so on and so forth, and get them to vote down the bans and prescriptions. Of course, probably what would then happen would be something on a bigger scale, like the anti-Corbyn witch hunt. Yeah. And they kicked out again. A party which can no longer pretend to be a general party of the working class. In more generally, my preference is for fraction work, in that being that there are people who work in the same way as, you know, not everybody, you don't say every member of the party must be a member of X union. We do say everybody should be a member of their appropriate trade union, but we don't say everybody should be a member of of X trade union, in spite of the fact that it might be the case that a lot of big fight is going on in X trade union and not in Y trade union. So in, in, from that point of view, it's better in terms of the Labour Party to do to work from the outside with a fraction working in the party rather than to work wholly inside the party. Or the same true of any other big socialist party, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the line that I in the three part series I wrote on. Oh dear, I'm trying to remember the title. This is this was back in 2010 or 2009 or something like that. That was essentially the line which I was arguing. You know, I have not myself joined the Labour Party in connection with the Corbyn surge. Largely because it would have been completely bleeding pointless because I'd just been giving the bureaucracy 25 quid to, to go kick through out. the process of expelling me because I've been writing under my, I've been writing under my own name in the weekly worker for not, not using a pseudonym for years now, A and B. Uh, Andrew Smith, who used to be the MP for Oxford, personally expelled me, threw me out of the Labour Party in the 1970s. <laughs> There you go. Um, so, like, we've seen, like, in the, I'm, I, I don't know the history of the, like, the twenties or stuff when the Communist Party was, was it officially a, affiliated to the Labour Party back then? The British Socialist Party, which was the core of the Communist Party, was officially affiliated to the Labour Party. Then, when they formed the Communist Party, they formed the Communist Party together with people from the. Socialist Labour Party, South Wales Socialist Society, and oh dear, where else? Uh, some of the guys from the uh, Workers Socialist Federation, the, Sylvia Pankhurst's organisation, though they didn't stay in long. There was a big fight about whether to be in the Labour Party or not to be in the Labour Party, which was then part of the Comintern stuff. Lenin's polemic in left-wing communism and infantile disorder is partly against the guys who refuse to fight for affiliation to the Labour Party. 
And then they applied for affiliation to the Labour Party and the Labour Party said, uh, not terribly surprisingly, fuck off. Uh, and they had people who were in the Labour Party by virtue of having already been in the Labour Party. So Saklat Vala was a Labour MP, communist Labour MP. Malone was a former Liberal MP who they won, or rather more exactly, the Comintern won Cecil Malone from the Liberal Party as a result of his having gone on a fact-finding mission to Russia. So they had people who, the point being that they, they had people who were in the Labour Party and it took four or five years, perhaps a bit more actually, for the Labour Party to systematically purge them out. And in fact, in spite of that, the uh, Communist Party ran people in the Labour Party in the 1930s as well. The Trotskyists, one of the things which was wrong with the Trotskyist entry project was that they imagined that by going into the Labour Party, they'd be going around the Communist Party and would escape from being under the shadow of the Communist Party. And of course, in reality, they went into the Labour Party and they found people who were either in the Communist Party or very strongly influenced by the Communist Party. And that went on being the case, which was a problem with the Trotskyist entry operations all the way through that they were trying to dodge around the question of the Communist Party and they couldn't succeed in doing so. So you had that, like, say, we'll call it an attempt that they got purged afterwards in, say, the 20s. With some remnants, we probably had another go in the 70s, 80s, you know, the militant and all that. The, the Trotskyists were in, but also the Communist Party as an outside organisation had a massive influence through the trade union broad lefts in the AEU and so on, on the Labour Party broad left. So, so they got they got purged, though, right? No, not at that level. The uh, oh, the unions, but at the Euro Communists took over the Communist Party. When the Euro Communists took over the Communist Party, they screwed over the Labour left, among other options. They went for the Blairites, and uh, a significant number of the Blairites were actually former Euro-Communists, like Jack Straw. He wasn't actually a Communist Party member, but he was in the periphery of the Euro-Communists. So the, the Labour left had as a spinal core the guys who were influenced fellow travellers of the CP, and they also had people who were actually in the CP in it. I'm not saying that this is... I, I'm not saying this is categorically the way to go it's a tactical option which is open but it has to be a tactical option which is open on condition that you don't subordinate what you're doing to the political identity of being part of the labor left which is what happens to so many bloody people that they start out we're going to go in and we're going to be trotskyists in the labor party but actually the political identity becomes subordinated to the Labour left. That, that's true of the PSF, French Socialist Party as well. The Lambert organisation in France was running guys in the Socialist Party for years. So we have this kind of like structural problem. Like you, To me, like it seems like you could spend 20 years building up forces adjacent or internal to the Labour Party, the unions, whatever, blah, blah, to try and get recognition. And you might win recognition for uh, the ability for a communist element or whatever to, faction to to be affiliated to it. And then they just come and they'd, they'd screw you over some other way. That, they, like that, that they're your class enemy. Like the party is essentially an enemy of revolutionary left. Of, that's true of doing electoral work in general. The uh, the parliament is an instrument of the capitalist class. It's true of the work which, when you're serious organisation, you're going to have to do in the rank and file of the armed forces. That's considerably stronger. The uh, I was just that not that long ago reading about after the July day since 1917, Lenin was hidden by the chief of police in Helsinki. Because the chief of police in Helsinki was a leftist. Uh, and they recruited, oh, God, what's the man's name? 
Jesus, there was a general officer in the Russian army who jumped from the Russian army to the to the Bolsheviks in October 1917. <laughs> so the point, my point is simply that you're going to, if you're building a mass party, you're going to do work in really quite hostile, a whole lot of very hostile environments. Back to the Bolsheviks again, the, the Russian Social Democrats um, went into the police trade union, which was set up by Father Gapom, who was a police agent running a fake trade union. But however, the police agent running a fake trade union, it turned out to be, it wouldn't, it, it couldn't be held back. The people that that the guys in the rank and file started raising demands, which then got uh, reflected in this police organized, police sponsored organization. Uh, that this sort of level of, I'm not saying, as I say, I'm not saying it's strategic line to be in the Labour Party or to be in any other uh, socialist party or anything like that. If anything, I think it's decreasingly significant because look at where we are now the right wing in control of the Labour Party in Scotland have wiped it out the Labour Party is now completely marginal in Scotland my estimation for what it's worth is that the likely consequence of the right wing taking back control from Corbyn is that that will happen to the Labour Party in England well this is the point I think it's like that from a kind of a historical point of view Personally, I think it's inevitable that a a radical left element would initially try to use something like the Labour Party or the Democratic Party in America. I just think historically that's like where people think they have to go and to do it. And I think that the lesson of Corbyn and some of and what say in, in Sanders is is a kind of like the futility of that of that strategy was like something they have to go through. To get but towards not- else, like what comes up, like let's say Starmer and the right, essentially do what they did in in Scotland, okay. But in Scotland, you had the you had the Scottish National Party to put the dagger in in Labour, essentially. And the point then is, what's your what's your dagger in England? A new Brexit party that the uh, Labour Party under Starmer nails its colours to a greater or lesser extent to the mast of the European Union and to the mast of the alliance with the United States and to liberal internationalism. And UKIP, you know, the the Brexit turn by Cameron resulted from the fact that UKIP was... Pushing right. Pushing the Tory party into third place and uh, challenging Labour seriously in the north and the coastal towns and so on and so forth, and pushing right. And uh, it seems to me that uh, certainly if Boris uh, is seen to do something which looks like a capitulation, I would expect uh, that uh, you'd get uh, more of an English nationalist, a more strongly English nationalist party emerging as an alternative to Labour in the so-called former Red Wall. That's a very negative view of what's happening. But the problem, in essence, is it, it's, is it the being in the Labour Party which stops these guys? Actually, no, it's they're internalising the norms of the Labour Party. So that instead of actually mobilising forces on the ground and enabling people to engage in their own creativity in the localities and to go out and build and do their own work, everything is top-down control. But they even expend like they expend their energy in fighting internal, like that's well, the kind of key point. They didn't bloody fight internally, but it they, be possible to carry on the fight internally in the Labour Party, and nonetheless do so in a way which mobilises forces on the ground, because you're actually turning people out to vote in the general committee meetings and mobilising people to fight against the right. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to fight against the right and the leadership of the Corbyn movement, Corbyn himself, but also the guys round straight left, what's his name, Andrew Murray and Milne and so on, weren't prepared to fight against the right. They wanted to win in government. They wanted to win the next election 
and form a government in coalition with uh, the right, and therefore they weren't prepared. They weren't prepared to stand up against the witch hunt. They weren't prepared to make big changes to fight for big changes on to fight for open selection, resel- mandatory reselection. They weren't prepared to stick with their own political positions. It was entirely a matter of how do we hold this coalition together on the basis that if we hold this coalition together, we can get a government which is a bit more left wing. Is that pressure not always there when you're when you're entering into one of the outside the party as well? Look at the Socialist Workers Party and the political character of uh, respect or the political character of uh, the Trade Union Socialist Coalition or its predecessor, no to EU, no to EU, yes to democracy. The political pressure, if you take that, if, if you make the political line that what we're in the business of is building a serious opposition of building the forces of the workers' movement on the ground, then it doesn't bloody matter whether you're doing that inside the party, if you can be inside the Labour Party or outside the Labour Party, because you're doing something different. You're going for a different conception of building up self-organisation, self-activity, creativity. And yes, it quite likely you'll get kicked out. It doesn't matter whether you get kicked out or not. It's immaterial because if you get kicked out in those circumstances, you get kicked out in a way which people can bloody understand. What we've had instead is a steady erosion of good militants getting kicked out and the bleeding leadership of the left won't defend them. There's no solidarity. Yes, that guarantees that you get nowhere, but that's equally true if you have this from the outside. But I, I'd say, like, if imagine if the left, what happened if the left leaders, left leaders, you're saying, backed up these people who are getting kicked out and trumped up anti-Semitism charges and stuff like that? What would happen to them? Like, I, I, I put forward a case that they would end up getting kicked out for anti-Semitism. It's not a question of uh, that it's uh, we have to guarantee that we're in the Labour Party. It's a question of how do you intersect this movement of two, three hundred thousand people which went into the Labour Party hoping for radical change. Yeah, And it doesn't matter if this winds up being a movement to create a new party outside the Labour Party or whether it winds up being uh, a, a huge battle inside the Labour Party. But if you don't fight because what you're concerned about is to create a Labour government and in order to create a Labour government, you have to have the alliance with the right. And in order to have the alliance with the right, uh, you have to keep your head down. Then uh, it doesn't matter whether you're inside or outside the Labour Party. That policy still leads back to right-wing Labourism. Yeah, I just think that, like the, I, I think like the move into entryism, like from what I can observe from people who were involved in it, you know, young people starting off into politics types, is that they can't believe. And they just get what happened and they get 100% disillusioned. And then you have a generation lost. That's certainly true. And I think that like... There was was nothing which we could do about that. Oh, true. True. But the lesson... There was things which the Socialist Workers' Party could have done about that. There was things which the Socialist Party could have done about that. There was things which the Morning Star could have done about that. But in order to do that, they'd have to overcome their own sect differentiations around the nature of the Soviet Union and the immediate turf interests of their little local bureaucracies and unify themselves. Um, (laughs) Because as it was, they were all trying to cling on to the coattails of the Corbyn movement, the Corbyn leadership, and the Corbyn leadership was clinging to the coattails of the Labour right wing. So that you're, it's, it isn't the question of organisational outside in or out organizational issue which is determinative here it's the question of what politics well i i think i think it's not simply what politics like uh, let me make a case here for you like uh, it's not 100 percent analogous like i'm not making the case that it shouldn't have happened what i'm making trying to make the overall case is like it's happened look we've learned how we've seen repeated lessons about what happens when you go in that radicals should be seeking to have structures of their own where they can determine them you know the interactions where you're where you're not fighting internally to the same extent as you are forced to do so under all sorts of 
of structural but problem, problems. But the problem with this is that the uh, if you're not fighting internally, you're not learning. I, I mean, like you could fight internally in your own own have your own fights, but not just a fight against basically a board wall. Right? To stop you. You know, it, 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 it's merely the bat you're internalizing the policy of bans and prescriptions because it's the policy of bans and prescriptions which says we don't allow leftists to organize on on communist principles. But in point of fact, actually, there's nothing to stop you organizing on communist principles yourself and risking uh, more or less with a degree of clandestinity, but risking getting uh, thrown out. If you get thrown out, you get thrown out. You can still organize on communist principles, but the, what these guys have done is to organize on Labour leftist principles inside or outside the Labour Party in ways which then uh, I agree is terribly demoralizing. It's unbelievably demoralizing that you do that, but it's just as demoralizing everybody who turned out on the big stop the war demonstrations gradually declining and gradually declining. Hey, there's loads of people who were utterly demoralized by that because we turned, we marched, we marched, we marched. It didn't stop the war. Well, like, surprise, surprise. You can't stop the war by marching. You can only actually stop the state going to the war, to war by overthrowing it. Or, you know, make the military unable to send the military. Or make the military <laughs> unable to act, which is essentially, yes, what the anti Vietnam War movement targeted. To do because mm. the US military was dependent on con conscription. Because of that, of course, the US, the NATO uh, adopted a principle against conscription in order to secure that armies should be secure against that sort of subversion. Okay, uh, let, let me just kind of counterpose something to you versus the Labour Party. Now, the analogies aren't going to be perfect or anything like so. Go easy on me. <laughs> but like, say in, in, say, when the troubles kicked off again in Northern Ireland, in the late 60s, early 70s. Like, historically in Ireland, you had the two major parties, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Fianna Fáil would have been seen as the more Republican of the two. It went against the treaty in, in 21, yeah. and they fought a civil war. Now, like, growing up, like, in the South where I did, and Sinn Féin wasn't a thing really at all. It was so unbelievably marginal. And there was old IRA men, very, very conducive to... Uh, helping out the IRA in the North and the Pro Bowls. That's just a reality. Like Sinn Féin could have pursued a strategy of entryism into Fianna Fáil. Like that could really have been a a, a strategy. Well, that was certainly uh, an element. Charlie Hockey, uh, as T-shirt, was uh, definitely played footsie with uh, the Pro Bowls. Well, they gun run. They got... They got the army. They literally de apparently delivered three hundred grand worth of arms or a hundred grand worth back in the day, which was a lot, to the provost yeah. through the Irish army. And it was the army sergeant, the army general, I think, or whatever, who got thrown under the bus. Uh, how he got kicked out of Fianna Fáil, or I think he got, he got kicked. He 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 got he lost his. I think he got lost his membership uh, of the cabinet anyway. But he ended up riding it back onto the tails for the party leadership. But the point is that like Sinn Féin could have actually entered into the into the Republican Party, or sorry, the, into the Fianna Fáil Party as a, you know, a tactic like, en the, you know, radical left entering the Labour Party. But they built up from small, from a small party, like Sinn Féin was, was a tiny element, you know, it was essentially... Yeah, you know, in essence I, what you've got is the, there's a split there's between Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, which went towards becoming an official communist organisation, and the provosts, who were more pure nationalist, green as anything and nothing but green. And in essence, when the civil rights movement kicked off in the north and the B-specials and the loyalists started attacking the nationalist areas in the north, the only guys who had any weapons to defend them with was the provost. And so in this situation, because the provosts were precisely because they were an armed group, yeah, they leaped to the head of this, uh, uh, this mass movement. They become the leaders of this mass movement in the north. And from the mass movement in the north, they're able to develop into what I guess is now the equivalent of Fianna Fáil when it was more nationalist, that, that, that they're an opposition party 
of a constitutional nationalist character. But Re uh, reasonably constitutional. Let's not get too carried away. But uh, um, well, the, you can see that in the sense of that they were not particularly radical over the uh, consequences of the financial crisis. They were not posing the question of power over the consequences of the financial crisis, and they were looking. They've been looking to get into coalition government without as yet success, but for a while they've been pushing for we want to be in coalition. Okay, so the, I don't know. Like that's that's I, exaggerating. I think, like, life but, uh, is 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 it is certainly the case that you don't want to be a party which is understood to be part of the current political game. And that's part of why it's wrong to enter into coalition governments, even if it looks as though by entering into coalition government, you're keeping these guys out. The same with Iran. It turned out to be the case that it was um, uh, the, the regime fell and it's Khomeini and his movement takes the benefit of it. Why does Khomeini and his movement take the benefit of it? The answer is because Khomeini and his movement have never played footsie with the Shah's regime, whereas today the uh, official Communist Party have played footsie with the Shah's regime. Okay, but then do we want... To, well, similarly, actually, the Somoza regime falls in Nicaragua. That's not because of a military defeat of the Somoza army by the Frente Sandinista. It's because... The Frente, Sandinista, the Frente Sandinista is a trivial little guerrilla group up in the hills and the Somoza regime falls apart out of its own internal contradictions and the Sandinistas are the guys who are outside of that political game. So, yeah, but then the question is, what can we do? Because it's clearly the case that we can't. It would be senseless for us to try and do guerrilla operations in mainland England. Uh, uh, like the, the point is not so much though about like the IRA, like uh, and Sinn Fein it's, being. It's how do you signal very clearly we are the enemies of this state regime? Now, again, I don't think that. I mean, I, to be honest, I think that the likely, the strong likelihood is that you will always get purged out of the Labour Party if you signal clearly we are the enemies of this constitutional regime. But it's a question of having the clarity of the understand, having the understanding of the masses that that's what's going on. That it's not that this is that this is you are being purged out of the Labour Party because you're the enemies of this constitutional order. Whereas actually Corbyn and Co. And it was also true of Tony Benn. Yeah, you know, these people are friends of this constitutional order. They are loyalists to this constitutional order. Hundred percent. And it's their loyalism to this constitutional order which actually facilitates the right wing purging them. But like, say, with with the, with the, getting back to Sinn Fein, say for example, like it's not the case that in the north, even at the height of the troubles, where like the provosts were armed, and you know we're saying they had a mass movement behind them. I think that's that is true. But at the height of the armed IRA in the early eighties. Like Sinn Fein up north was ten percent. That's all it was. They they yeah, were even they, were, they were they weren't they weren't even it, the dominant it's, uh, it's Catholic. The it's the it's the, the ballot box and the armor light turn. They start taking elections seriously, and what kicks it off is uh, Bobby Sands' hunger strike and the Republican hunger strike in uh, what's the damn place called? Yeah, H blocks, oh, and that kicks off that uh, it's the two things together. On the one hand, that the Sinn Féin had stood in elections, but it was never a big deal issue. Yeah, The uh, Provo leadership in the 80s turned to this ballot box and armor light line rather than trying to keep the uh, out of the sands, hung, the hunger strikers and so on, which wasn't something which they kicked off. It was something which the guys in jail kicked off. And then the leadership picked up on McGuinness, I think, as much as... Um, Adams. Adams. Well, Adams was the political front man. McGuinness was the guy who was clearly in the military leadership as well as the political leadership. But that, in a sense, yes, they had a, they had a mass movement of sympathy 
in the armed struggle, but then it became something more arising out of the H block struggle and arising out of the turn to electoral work. It's very difficult to predict what will kick something like this off. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.